to render us a Hessian colony, which we most incontestably are. Well, then he got even more angry and he said to the Philharmonic, he said, if all their artistic affections are unalterably German, let them pack back to Germany and enjoy the police and bayonets and aristocratic kicks and cuffs of that land where an artist is a serf to a nobleman as the history of all their great composers shows. While America has thus far been able to do the chief things for the dignity of man, forsooth she must be denied the brains for original art and must stand like a beggar deferentially cap in hand when she comes to compete with the ability of any dirty German village. And there's a political dimension to this, obviously, where he's living in a land of freedom, at least freedom for white men like him. And he says that if we want to replicate German culture, why don't we rep replicate the German police state here that people had left to find the American dream in the United States? Now, to be fair, I need to give you the other side of the argument, the critique against Bristow and Fry. And someone wrote anonymously to the press, and I know why they did it anonymously, because again, Fry was a critic and would easily kind of torch them uh, in response. But this person says, imagine the conflict of American and German music on the battlefield. The Teutonic army is drawn up in martial array, furnished with ammunition by Captain Mozart. And on the other side, there are one or two violins, maybe reinforced by some of our American instruments. Now here we go. With an awful shock, the quadruple fugue in Mozart's C major symphony meets in midair a strain from, from, from what? And so if we take a step back from this situation for a minute, is it really fair to compare Bristow's first symphony to Mozart's Jupiter symphony? On the one hand, Mozart was long dead and styles had changed. And on the other, Mozart had gotten about a 60 year head start on people knowing, learning, and appreciating his music. Now, this situation, to close my thoughts on the Philharmonic, it reflected, the situation reflected the molasses-like pace at which American critics developed a framework for evaluating new compositions. And this is still a problem that we have today, that some of the pieces last night were very challenging because it, we don't have much of a framework for understanding them. But just like composers, the critics were burdened by the ubiquity of Beethoven and other German compositions. If this was all they knew, what was a new symphony supposed to sound like? What made a symphony good? And that Bristow was an American only added difficulty because the premieres of new works by contemporaries like Mendelssohn and Schumann, critics could read reviews from the German press to get an idea of what the music sounded like before they heard it in person. But if they're hearing a world premiere for the first time in the US, they can't steal these impressions to shape their views. And so the German composers and European composers in general had a built-in advantage over the local community. And so no one really knew how to judge new compositions by American composers like the jury that was demanded in the Bill of Rights. So was there a fair trial? Now, I want to jump ahead about 100 years. And noteworthy in this context, as I mentioned earlier, is that the conflict in the 1850s was about white men arguing with other white men. And the wedge issue was being European or American born. That was, you know, that was the distinguishing factor between who had an advantage and who didn't. Now, we can very easily note that women and composers of color were simply given no opportunities for performance compared to the few opportunities for men. Now, it's also true that in the United States, at least, conservatories denied admission to students of color, 
thus restricting their capacity for compositional training, and that women who were students in conservatories typically studied pedagogy so that they could return to their hometowns as music teachers. And so composition and orchestral performance at the conservatories tended to be restricted just to the men, whereas the women were learning different things, uh, while composers of color were simply barred altogether, and that includes indigenous musicians. Now, this scene began to change in the late 1880s and 1890s. And schools like the New England Conservatory in Boston began admitting more students of color, including women. Now, these individuals did not have good experiences socially at the conservatory, as Kira's research has shown. Um, but they were able to leverage their training into more classical music spaces than ever before, including composition. And so one example of these beneficia the beneficiaries of this openness uh, is the focus of my current scholarship, as Elena mentioned, the composer Florence Price. So Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas in the late 1880s, studied at the New England Conservatory from 1903 to 1906, moved back to Arkansas where she lived until 1927, and then spent the rest of her career in Chicago where she died in 1953. And so if we're thinking about her career, it's essentially the first half of the 20th century. Now, some of you may be aware that Price's music has experienced an extraordinary revival after a large bundle of her manuscripts were found in an abandoned house about an hour south of Chicago. And that includes the Cleveland Orchestra, which I believe has performed Price's fourth symphony uh, in the past season or so. And I'll say more about this uh, Cleveland Orchestra connection in a second. Now, the house where this music was found was Price's summer home, and it had fallen into disuse and disrepair after her daughter's death in 1975. And so this discovery in 2009 was really transformational. But in any case, like Bristow and Fry, Price as a composer perceived her own situation through the lens of a fair trial, as we'll see. Now, Price began writing orchestral pieces relatively late in her career, beginning in 1929. And so she was about 41 years old when she started writing for the orchestra. And she was very active for four years. Her orchestral music debuted with the Chicago Symphony. So she started at the top in 1933 with a, comp a competition winning piece that was uh, broadcast over the radio and got rave reviews in the Chicago press. She continued to be active during the later 1930s, during the New Deal period, which, which shuttled a lot of money to composers. And this achieved a peak in 1940, when the orchestra that was the Detroit Symphony, but was working under a different name, performed her third symphony. And so she's riding a wave of positive performances of her orchestral music. And so in the year 1941, she decides to try someone else, Serge Kuzovitsky, the conductor of the Boston Symphony and a champion of American music. And I'd like to read you a little bit of the first letter of several that she wrote to Kuzovitsky. She says, my dear Dr. Kuzovitsky, although I have had performances of my scores here in the Middle West by the Chicago Symphony, the American Concert Orchestra, the Chicago Woman Symphony Orchestra, the Michigan Symphony Orchestra, and several local symphonic bands, and the United States Marine Band. Let's just add that one on as, as the, uh, the icing on top. I am entirely unknown in the East, except perhaps for songs which Marian Anderson includes upon her programs. I am very desirous of a hearing in the East. She continues, after graduating from the New England Conservatory, I return to my native South to teach. I have an accumulation of scores and manuscripts which during the past few years here in Chicago, I have been bringing to light with the result, several performances. Having colored blood in my veins and having been born in the South, I believe I can say that I understand real Negro music as well, if not better than the kind I studied in the East. I have an overture based on the Negro spiritual sinner, please don't let this harvest pass, which was performed here with results most encouraging to me. And here she puts the ball in his court. She says, hearing that you are particularly interested in American music, I am hoping you will give something of mine a trial. 
I have a symphony in which I tried to portray a cross-section of Negro life and psychology as it is today, influenced by urban life north of the Mason and Dixon line. It is not program music. I merely had in mind the life and music of the Negro of today, and for that reason treated my themes in a manner different from what I would have done if I had centered my attention upon the religious themes of antebellum days, or yet the ragtime and jazz which followed. Rather, a fusion of these colored by present cultural influences. This symphony was lately performed in Detroit. The critics said things that made me very happy, but more eager than ever to write better music. From now on, I shall be devoting most of my time to writing and working toward that unattainable thing, one's ideal, the American dream. That's my word, not hers. And so she's seeking a trial. She writes several more letters to Kuzovitsky and sends him a score, and he looks at the score, and she reminds him that he's interested in American music and he says, thanks, but no thanks. Was not willing to give it a trial. Now that story is, is somewhat well known because it's been reported in the press, but less well known is that the very next year, November 1942, she wrote to Mr. Arthur Rodchinsky, director of the Cleveland Orchestra. She took a different tack, she said, would you be so kind as to try over or examine some of my orchestral work? To try, to give it a trial. Beside the symphony number three mentioned in the enclosed folder, I also have a symphony in D minor. Symphony number four that was played here this season. She says, then there is a concerto in one movement for piano and orchestra and a concert overture based on a Negro spiritual which was well received here in Chicago. And Rodchinsky, writes back through his secretary and says, Dr. Rochinsky regrets that due to heavy mid-season activities of the Cleveland Orchestra, he will be unable to examine your scores. So there was no trial, no opportunity for her music to be heard at that time. Now, unsuccessful with Kuzovitsky and Rodchinsky, she still had to make a living, and so she started writing music for children for use in schools and private lessons. And she was very successful at this and published a lot of music. But then about 10 years later, she shifted gears once more in 1952, and she wrote her second violin concerto. And this, I could talk for another half hour about this moment in history, but the Louisville Orchestra started commissioning a ton of music in the late 1940s and 1950s. And the conductor at that time was someone that Price had worked with in Chicago. And so she heard about the commissioning project and she wrote this conductor, Robert Whitney, and she said, during the last several years, Mr. Whitney, I have been rather busy at writing commercially. That is, the publishers ask me for such music as have sales appeal in the teaching field. I have recently decided to give more time to the writing of the kind of music which lies closest to my heart and already have been fortunate enough to win a number of composition contests and hear manuscripts perform, among which was the TV performance a few weeks ago, a group of pieces of mine performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra on their program of American music. And so she goes on to say that on May 26th of 1953, I shall sail for England and France where I will have the pleasure of hearing the performance of several of my numbers. I will be particularly grateful if I may hear from you before that time, if you might be interested in giving my music a trial. Now, sadly, she died less than a month later. She didn't go on the trip to England. She didn't go on the trip to France. And the Louisville Orchestra sent her a letter, several, actually several years later, saying, I'm sorry, but we won't be able to perform your music or give you a commission. So she was once again had this trial in her grasp and was left behind. So in closing, I want to open the door to thinking about the importance of a fair trial. As we heard last night, giving a piece a fair trial can reap massive rewards. And so I want to put this into a little bit of a different context with the, the focal point of this festival, Puccini's opera La Fanciulla del West, which premiered at the Metropolitan Opera in New York in 1910. 
Now, I find it to be a curious coincidence that the first American opera performed at the Met was performed that same year, 1910, even though the Met had been around since 1883. It had taken them about 30 years to put on an American piece. And this was a composer named Frederick Converse's opera called The Pipe of Desire, an opera that I don't know has been performed since 1910. Now, this convergence of Converse's opera and Fanchula del West got the Metropolitan Opera thinking, you know, we need to do more for American opera. And so they said, well, we'll just start a competition. There are no American operas. We need someone to write a new one. And so that led to the first American premiere at the Met, an opera named Mona by a composer named Horatio Parker. Now, from my perspective as a historian, I think it's very noteworthy that the composers I mentioned earlier, William Henry Fry and George Frederick Bristow, had written operas as early as 1846 and 1855, and that audiences loved these operas. One of them was on um, uh, Rip Van Winkle, that American tale. And so it's a bit mind-boggling that the Met would need to host a competition on the presumption that good American operas weren't already out there. So the biggest effect of a lack of fair trials, in my opinion, is a significant cultural amnesia that allows audiences, institutions, and even scholars to lose touch with their own histories and even their own heritage. Last night was such a privilege to experience personally because it was the first time I had heard any piece on the program in live performance. And I think that was true for almost everyone in the audience. And what that means is that now I have new connections to that repertoire. The audience has new connections to the repertoire. The musicians in this institution have connections to that repertoire. And these are bonds that we can't let break again. Thank you. All right, hopefully you can hear me okay? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so thanks for uh, having us here. Thank you again, Elena, for the invitation and to the Cleveland Orchestra uh, for hosting us. Um, you're going to see, <laughs> my talk has a lot of overlap with Doug, uh, which, is, which is good. I think that's a good thing. It means that um, you know, you're going to, uh, get, I'll be getting at this from different angles, but it's really fascinating realizing just um, uh, how, how much perhaps um, we are struck by the same themes in American history, in transatlantic history, et cetera. Um, just a tiny reminder, which is that I am a German historian by training uh, and also a musicologist. Um, so you'll, you'll see, I think, both of those things in what I'm talking about today. Um, so right, I'm going to give a different perspective on the American dream. I've chosen to call this uh, presentation something like European art music and the African American dream. Um, so I'll be focusing a lot on um, African American classical musicians um, and Europe. And I say African-American dream in part also because uh, the American dream has always been a painful mythology for black Americans who were brought over first as enslaved people from West Africa. Uh, the frustration of being denied this American dream remains a through line of African-American history. And it's also in the, in the concert program notes, which was really great to, to read that as well. Um, so focusing on black musicians' dreams, which I'm going to do now, however, flips our, it flips the script. It changes changes our lens, and it means that we're going to focus on an unlikely place, which is Europe. Um, and in so doing, what I want to do with this is to better account for black involvement in the production and dissemination of classical music. Um, as we're going to talk about, um, even at times of extreme white violence and racism in American history, within, within and outside of classical music, uh, black classical musicians nonetheless found freedom and liberation in classical music, just not in the ways we might always expect. 
So in this regard, I'm joining a growing number of scholars who are trying to get better at tackling this question of how do we better understand black involvement in classical music. Um, and that includes uh, musicologists like Carol Oja right now, who's writing a book on the desegregation of classical music in the 1950s. Uh, Doug Shadel is here uh, talking about uh, Florence Price and other composers. Um, and like Doug and like Carol, I'm not entirely satisfied with a lot of the frame works that we have used so far to examine the lives and careers of African-American classical musicians. So instead of thinking of African-Americans as simply empty vessels waiting to be filled with the glorious knowledge of Brahms, or as passive consumers of white-dominated media, I want us to consider how they were active in their own propagation of what the music of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms meant to them. So simply by shifting our focus onto black agency in the production of classical music, Music, uh, we dismantled the notion that classical music's uh, dissemination in America was unidirectional. So I'm going to point out here the Germanness of my investigation, which I feel like Doug was railing against for a while. <laughs> Right, because German music is so central to what we're going to be, to, I mean, so much of today. And, um, and I promise I'm not just saying that because I'm a German historian. Um, as Doug has been talking about, um, it, and what we'll see as well is that African-American debates about classical music have a particularly German focus to them because the canon was so German. I, I think I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because Doug already got into this so well, but I do want to point out his really great quote from orchestrating the nation, quote, there can be no doubt, he writes, um, that the sacralization of art fueled by the desire for German music of whatever brand left a lasting imprint on the culture of classical music that is still with us today. So this is affecting uh, conservatory of music programs, which I'll talk about. It's, 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 you know, in their curricula, it's affecting all kinds of different things. And then by the late 19th century, as I tell my students a lot, uh, by the late 19th century, the joke in the United States was that there were two types of music, German music and bad music, right? So that's sort of the joke there. Um, the framework that I have found helpful lately for thinking about um, black involvement in classical music and German music in particular, and their writings about it comes from a body of scholarly works in the field of African American history um, on black internationalism. So this is when I will sound a little academic, and I apologize, but it's helpful. It's really helpful, I promise, for understanding what I'm going to be talking about. So black internationalism, the idea behind this, you know, what is this idea of black internationalism, or what what is this concept? Um, and the way that the historian Keisha Blaine describes it is that black internationalism, quote, captures African Americans' global racial consciousness. And so historians of black internationalism are committed to documenting the rise in an emerging black culture that was responding to slavery, colonialism, white supremacy. But the thing that's interesting for us is that black internationalism is and has always been about how black people have looked outward uh, beyond their nation state to find both liberation and coll collaborators willing to help bring about their freedom. I mean, this is where we're going to talk about, you know, the, the American dream and freedom. So often writings of black internationalism stress uh, forging black diasporic links. So um, Garveyism spreading around the world or James Baldwin when the African American intellectual and an, an author, you know, his connections to people in Paris, uh, people of African descent in Paris. So those are the more typical understandings of black internationalism, how black people have engaged with other black people around the world. Um, but there are examples of black Americans working with um, white non-Americans that can provide us with a path forward to thinking about African Americans in classical music. Um, and so there's a helpful book, this is the last academic thing I think I'm gonna talk about, but um, there's a really helpful book by um, a literature professor named Kate Baldwin called The Cold War and the Color Line. And in it, she argues that instead of seeing African Americans as uh, naive converts to Soviet ideology in particular, so, you know, it's about Soviet Russia and African Americans, you know, so instead of seeing African Americans as these naive converts to Soviet ideology, and then simply them pairing it parroting it back, uh, we should recognize the agency of African American intellectuals who promoted Soviet internationalism. So by flipping the script, she argues, we come to see that African Americans saw Soviet internationalism as an escape 
from oppressive old systems. So African-American writings on Soviet Russia, she's arguing in her book, can be interpreted not necessarily or only as like blind followings of Soviet ideas, but rather as acts of resistance. So my question then becomes, you know, could classical music have offered something similar to black people? Could listening to, playing, and critiquing a Mozart sonata also occasionally be interpreted as moments of defiance? What might it look like or sound like to our ears if we heard black writings uh, about the great masters and performances of them as, as ambitious dreams in the Jim Crow era? So that's what I'm going to be talking about a, a little bit. And really, I think what I'm going to be tracing over the next, for the rest of my presentation, I guess, um, is, is thinking about uh, the rise of black classical musicians in the 19th century. So we are going to overlap in, time, in terms of time period. I'll be talking mostly about after the Civil War until also like the 1940s and 50s. Um, so maybe after, like in the Q&A, we can talk about like, post-1950 or something like that, um, you know. And so one of the questions that I've become really fascinated with, in part because it's just such a simple question, and also I get asked it a lot, and maybe, Doug, I wonder if you get asked this question too, of like, well, how did black people in America get into classical music? Like, how did they even get into it in the first place? Mm. Um, well, on the one hand, what I oftentimes say is like, they've always been there. Like we've all, So it's, it's really interesting to, to see that we're in this moment of like discovery black composers to a certain extent uh, because they've always been there. Um, and at least for me as a European historian, you know, we can take it really far back in time to Vicente, uh, Vicente Lusitano, who was a black composer of madrigals in particular from 15th century Portugal. Uh, he traveled to Rome, Italy. He eventually converted to Protestantism, Calvinism in particular, which is like very something, and, um, and <laughs> settled, in Germany, <laughs> settled in Germany. You know, and then has anybody heard of that film about Chevalier Saint Georges, that's like come out recently, right? You know about him in in France in the 18th century, um, and a couple other people just to point out names: George Bridge Tower, who maybe some people have heard of, who was friends with Beethoven until they got into a fight over a girl, which is like very Beethoven. Um, Vittoria, Tassi, uh, Vittoria Tassi Tramontini, who was a black Italian opera singer in 18th century Vienna. Edmond de Day, a black French composer. I mean, these are all examples of black composers who were uh, concertizing, performing, composing, and had careers long before William Grant Still or Nathaniel Dett existed in America. But at least in the American case, we can turn to a few specific moments where we can think about how African Americans specifically got into classical music. So certainly um, after the Civil War uh, and the abolishing of slavery, we start seeing more black Americans become what we would consider to be professional working musicians. Um, and this happens in spite of, I should say, mainstream uh, white American society who generally refused to grant them access access to conservatories of music or to even let them into their music halls. So this is also another basic question that I think we can ask ourselves better. You know, it's, and again, it's so simple, but it's still a question that I think requires conversation and, 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 and definition which is this, which is prior to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s, were African Americans able to enter any symphony orchestra hall that they wanted to, or any opera house? You know, that's a question that it's, it's so fascinating to think about who's tried to answer it, or like has, have people tried to answer that? Um, you know, and can we try to answer it in ways that move beyond the anecdotal? And I can show you some photos perhaps after this. I had a PowerPoint uh, thingy where you could see some headlines um, that that indicate, for example, African American, an African American couple in, the in 1918 in New York City being turned away from a piano recital uh, and things like that. So looking into the history of, of structural and systemic racism in American classical music as a German historian has occasionally given me this feeling of like whiplash, you know, that the mythology of colorblindness and classical music has meant that there are fewer historical studies than we might assume. And as Doug has already pointed out, I mean, I felt like I found this out the hard way by asking different archivists at conservatories of music for their lists of black students in the 19th and early 20th centuries, like before 1950, and, and they 
I mean, they wrote back really sheepishly being like, oh, we're really sorry, but we had none. We had a policy of not admitting any, right? Um, so yeah, they had no, no records to give me. So in other words, being, so, so if we're thinking about then how do black classical music, how did you get into this field? How do you get into this world? A world that I should say many people loved, that they loved the music. This is still the case for me as well, which I'm happy to talk about, that this is music that gives me great joy. I turn to it in moments of grief. I turn to it to make sense of the world. Um, so, so being resourceful then, in the face of such violence and oppression, um, black Americans basically decided to start building their own institutions for themselves. So the greatest way that we can see that is through the creation of black institutions of higher education, HBCUs, historically black colleges. Um, and the one that, it, that becomes really the epicenter, at least in my book, for this is Fisk University, which is located in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and it really became the most important epicenter in black America for classical music education, uh, modeling their institute on Oberlin's Conservatory of Music and the New England Conservatory of, of Music, both of which honestly were just mimicking Leipzig uh, Conservatory of Music, I should say. Um, so by 1896, um, Fisk University's Conservatory of Music had 132 students studying piano, organ, violin, or voice. They had a roster of black faculty that had trained at some of the most renowned, renowned conservatories in Europe and also at Oberlin in particular. I can talk about why that's the case uh, later on. Fisk University had a music library that collected original letters by composers such as Franz Liszt, Beethoven, Richard Wagner, Karl Maria von Weber. Uh, by 1922, they had a student and faculty orchestra uh, that organized to perform symphonies and choral orchestral works for the local community. And then for decades, I had this image, I will, I will happily show you afterwards. Uh, for decades, they had um, a Mozart society, mm -hmm. it was called, which was a mixed choral ensemble formed in 1881. It was a source of pride for Fisk University, performing large choral orchestral works by Mendelssohn, Brahms, and other composers. So they would do like Mendelssohn's Elijah Oratorio and things like that. So, you know, the problem nonetheless remains, like we see how uh, black people began to gain access to classical music in spite of white violence, in spite of discrimination, in spite of threats. And just an example of this, while years ago, while looking through Fisk University's uh, archives, you know, and reading through their student newspaper, on one page, it's like the Mozart Society is performing, you know, like Haydn or something, or not Haydn, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say um, Handel's Messiah, like they're doing a little bit of Handel's Messiah, you know, and then the next page, it's like the KKK is threatening to burn the school down, right? And they've had to build a new wall, right? I mean, so just to give you a sense of what they're experiencing, right? Um, right, so nonetheless, okay, you're studying at a conservatory of music, um, whether it's an HBCU or in particular Oberlin College, which allowed a lot of black students in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, the question is, what opportunities did they have to succeed outside of an HBCU? Um, so here is where we start addressing this larger history as well, because there are so many examples of black people trying to get in, but being shut out being told at auditions that they weren't good enough and not knowing what to believe. Uh, Marian Anderson and Nina Simone both talk about that, by the way, that racism makes you paranoid. Were they really being rejected by the Curtis Institute because they weren't good enough or was it because they were black? At least Nina Simone's teachers were honest enough with her to tell her that it was the latter and that they'd found that out from the committee after her audition. So there are two examples that I find really striking here. Um, this is based on doing research in Oberlin College's archives in 2015 and 2016. Uh, so there was a really uh, brilliant pianist named Jean Costin, an African-American pianist, um, who studied at Oberlin College in the 1930s. Um, she had also studied abroad in Denmark with the pianist Axel Skierna, and she won Oberlin's toughest, like, 
uh, competition, uh, concerto competition. Um, and I find in the archives that her professors are anxiously fretting about her in letters back and forth to each other. They don't know what to do because she's fallen into a depression. Her piano teacher writes in a memo, quote, her feeling earlier seemed to be that because she is colored and wouldn't have a chance to do anything worthwhile when she leaves Oberlin, that there was little use in trying anymore. And here's the thing, she was right. She was so right. Have any of you heard of Jean Costin? Yeah. No, right? So, so what was a black woman instrumentalist supposed to do in the 1930s? Another incident uh, from 1925, and it's also funny you're talking about the Metropolitan Opera House, because I'm going to talk about the Metropolitan Opera House in a similar way. Uh, in 1925, when the Italian opera singer Eduardo Ferrari Fontana staged a competition at the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City to find a black woman to sing Verdi's Aida. And he confessed, this Italian tenor, he confessed, quote, it has always been a mystery to me why impresarios have not sought a Negro voice for an opera like Aida. And much to the shock and later horror of the Metropolitan Opera House, over 250 women responded to Ferrari Fontana's request for black singers, all stating that they were ready to sing the part. And many of them were. Classically trained singers such as Muriel Ron, uh, who um, in 1959 became the first black musical director of what is now the Frankfurt Opera. Uh, Florence Colt Halbert, the first black woman to perform Verdi's Aida in Europe, you know, they were both shortlisted for this role. Yet despite the overwhelming proliferation of letters and telegrams seeking an audition, the Metropolitan Opera House shut down this vocal experiment. So speaking of fair trial, I feel like we're seeing it again here as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to make this into some sort of experiment, uh, let's say you're a talented black violinist uh, born right here in Cleveland in the 1950s. Like, what options are available to you? As far as I can tell, you have three choices if it's like 1952 or something in Cleveland. Um, one, you can try to get by with a middling career, knowing you're probably never going to land a permanent orchestra gig or be a concertizing soloist. Uh, two, you can leave classical music altogether. So think of all the people who started off and trained in classical music and then left. Nina Simone, Miles Davis, uh, Will Marion Cook, uh, who was one of the first uh, producers of Broadway, Black Broadway. Um, he studied at the Royal Conservatory of Music in Berlin in the 1890s. He studied uh, uh, violin, you know, and he switched to popular music. <laughs> So right, choices, middle, like, you know, middling career, uh, leave classical music altogether for jazz popular music, which in theory could give you more money. Um, you know, but the last option becomes increasingly appealing to many, which is where I come in. Go to Europe. Go to Europe. Europe, many black people thought, could be the land of acceptance to them. Europeans could understand them if Americans refused to. And we see this over and over again in African American responses after they've gone to a tour in Europe and then come back. So, you know, here's one example from an African American opera singer named Sissy Aretta Jones, um, who traveled and performed in Germany, in Berlin in 1895. You know, when asked if there was a difference in her reception between American and European audiences, Sissy Aretta Jones responded, quote, yes, a marked difference. In Europe, there is no prejudice against my race. It matters not to them in what garb an artist comes, so he be an artist. It is the artist's soul they look at there, not the color of his skin. About a decade later, the African-American violinist uh, and recent transplant to Europe, Cl uh, Clarence Cameron White, made the same argument in an interview with the African-American newspaper, The New York Age. Quote, on every side, you find that the European musician and music lover as well realizes that music is too broad and too universal to be circumscribed by the complexion of the skin or texture of the hair. This isn't true, by the way, I should say. That, that's what my book looks at, uh, that European audiences are totally racializing them. 
But nonetheless, black statements were often, more often than not, indictments of American racism, more than reflections of Europe's own complicated racial terrain, which I'm very happy to talk about in the Q&A. That is like the subject basically of my entire book. But what matters here for the purposes of today is that black people were looking for freedom. They were looking for places where they could finally be accepted because they couldn't find that in the United States. The reason why so many African Americans began to argue this line of thinking is in part because of, and this is a really interesting sort of story in itself, um, it's in part because of German immigrant musicians and European musicians who worked with African American classical musicians at times when white Americans wouldn't. And the range of black musicians who studied with German teachers in the United States is it's wild. It includes composers such as Scott Joplin, um, Harry Lawrence Freeman, uh, pianists such as Nina Simone, who is actually a direct musical descendant of Clara Schumann, which is wild. Uh, Hazel Harrison, who was a pianist who performed with the Berlin Philharmonic in 1904, a violinist. I mean, I have a whole list of different uh, African-American musicians who studied in particular with, with German teachers. There are dozens and dozens of names on this list. The preference among uh, wealthy African-American families for German teachers was so prevalent that the Negro Music Journal, it was the first, so the Negro Music Journal is the first journal dedicated to uh, music written by and for uh, black Americans. It's from the early 20th century, 1902 to 1904. Um, so the Negro Music Journal at one point starts complaining about the popularity of German teachers uh, in 1903. So in an editorial for the journal, um, the main editor writes, quote, if we desire a white teacher on his merit, that is all right. Um, but if we desire him on his color or nationality, then we are surely wrong. Uh, yet, he complains, uh, many of our people engage a teacher on this basis. I have repeatedly heard the expression, my child is studying under a German teacher. Um, well, this would not be so ridiculous if these teachers had been engaged on their merits as teachers rather on, you know, being German. Um, so we see that, in other words, there's the African American family seeking out German teachers. And that also, then, what's so fascinating to sort of flip it around is how German teachers then begin to work with these musicians and endorse them to go overseas to Europe. So the main examples I'm going to talk about, which are, are pretty well known, I think, is actually um, in terms of people that we, we know, Scott Joplin uh, and Nathaniel Dett. So Scott Joplin, who also came up in Doug's talk, um, he at one point studied with a German teacher uh, named Mr. Ernst in St. Louis in 1894. And that same year, the St. Louis Dispatch, the newspaper reported, quote, so deeply is Mr. Ernst impressed with the ability of Joplin that he intends to take with him to Germany next summer copies of Joplin's work with the view of educating the dignified disciples of European masters into an appreciation of the real American ragtime melodies. So Ernst's public proclamation of Joplin's talent and abilities most likely benefited Scott Joplin's career. By suggesting that Joplin's music could find a European audience, uh, this teacher indicated that Joplin's, teacher, that, uh, that Joplin's talents had merits that reached beyond white Americans and their refusal to recognize them. German audiences were the real tastemakers after all, and if they admired Joplin's music, then it meant his compositions were indeed worthy of listening. But by insisting that Joplin's work could find an audience outside of the United States, Ernst, like other German teachers, planted a seed in black students' minds. Their musicianship was appreciated beyond the shores of the United States. If white Americans would not accept them, perhaps Europeans might. In 1890s Niagara Falls, Nathaniel Dett, another big African-American composer who also studied at Oberlin, He's actually training as a high school student with an Austrian music teacher. Um, and he's, he also, while he's in Niagara Falls, encounters a German uh, visitor who talks to him and teaches him, or sort of introduces him to uh, uh, Antonin Dvorak. He's an acquaintance of Antonin Dvorak. Um, and, he, uh, and so Nathaniel Dett performs for this, um, this German visitor who's in Niagara Falls. And after, um, after that, uh, that performance, uh, Nathaniel Dett found himself on the receiving end of a strange request. 
quote, um, he urged me to come to Germany for study, leaving me his card, which for years I treasured chiefly as a souvenir. Dad was apparently stunned by this offer, but also dismissive, dismissive of it. Quote, at the time, there was little respect for Negro music or its possibilities. So only later, after hearing the Kneisel Quartet perform Dvorak's music while Dad was a student at Oberlin, did he start to believe in the possibility of creating African-American art music and that he could be the one to perform it or to compose it. It would be naive to believe that German musicians were somehow free from the politics of American racism. Nor should we see them as rescuers of black musical talent, plucking young African Americans from a path of obscurity to reveal to them their true musical promise. African Americans, of course, were the ones hungry for training, compelled by a desire to sing, play, and listen to music that consumed their thoughts. They sought out teachers, requested auditions, and set up music lessons for their own musical and intellectual growth, often at great financial and social expense. But what does remain striking to me is the international nature of these collaborations. If a black musician were to succeed in the world of classical music, the likelihood that a musician from outside the United States was behind this person's career was fairly high. The transnational nature of their relationship might have permitted German teachers to imagine other possibilities of being for their black students, not seeing black lives and careers solely through the lens of American race relations. And it also might have encouraged black students to find meaning and beauty beyond America's shores. So African-American engagement with European art music made it possible for them to dream. It made it possible for them to imagine themselves in another country altogether, far away from the racist strictures trying to define and restrict their actions and, be and beliefs. This black future lay in the German musical past. The siren song of the Austro-German canon beckoned them to Europe, singing to them that they too could join a transatlantic chorus to shed the skin of white supremacy and become the pinnacle of black musical achievement would require going to Europe, a place of liberation in the minds of many black Europeans. So booking tickets on boats sailing to Hamburg, some African Americans finally began to make this dream of visiting the land of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms a reality. And these artists, I should say, arrived in Europe with a deep and intimate knowledge of German musical culture. Once there, they sought out new and liberating spaces to grow and perform. Encouraged by their own teachers who were either from Central Europe or who had studied there, they became part of what um, people called the Black Atlantic in their travels to and from Europe. So black classical musicians pursued a different musical solution to the problem of race's entrenched barriers. If the United States could not provide for their musical and intellectual growth, if the United States failed to protect them from the violence and oppression of racism, German-speaking Europe, the heart of musical universalism, might finally be the place where the powers of music could transcend racial discourse and defeat racial determinism. Thank you. decided to program um, music by Scott Joplin or William Grant Steele or Julia Perry or Ravan Chacon, uh, who wasn't African-American, he is um, uh, Native American. Uh, why their music ended up on the programs of this festival, which is centered around uh, a major opera by uh, a very famous European composer? That's specifically why. For some reason, this country undervalued other composers, as uh, you both explained to us very nicely. And Puccini's uh, Fanciulla um, um, inadvertently and without 
bad intentions um, highlights these issues for us today. He certainly didn't have the same perspective when he was writing uh, this opera in 1910 as we do today. He couldn't have imagined conversations happening at the time around his opera along the lines of what we are hearing today. And in fact, he uh, actually made an effort to somehow represent the American society. As we know, the subject matter is very much based on um, uh, an American uh, story um, uh, and on the perception of the American Western front frontier as uh, an open space for um, you know, self-renewal and for achieving the American dream. Uh, some of the best tunes in the um, opera are based on uh, Native American melodies. He did uh, do some research. He studied the existing material. Yes, it was published and transformed and reharmonized differently, not the way um, the native composers would have done it themselves. But he do, did use the material. Uh, there is a strange con controversy, though. He did use those beautiful melodies while representing white characters, not mm -hmm. the native characters mm -hmm. that do appear in the mm -hmm. opera mm -hmm. in a slightly mm -hmm. derogatory way. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we are looking at it anachronistically today. We are not in 1910. He couldn't have imagined these issues, especially being an Italian composer. Mm -hmm. So um, we decided to program music that was being written at the time or slightly later uh, in order to show what was going on in this country and in order to demonstrate that other people could have different perceptions and perspectives on the American dream idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to mention something about uh, the festival uh, as a whole. Uh, the Cleveland Orchestra um, uh, has been uh, partnering with a number of local organizations on this festival, uh, including the public library, this fabulous university uh, that is hosting us today. Thank you, Case Western New York University for uh, offering us this space for, for this fascinating discussion. Um, and also the Cleveland Museum of Art um, is a major partner. And just yesterday I uh, was very privileged and excited to um, visit the museum and walk around this fabulous collection. Mm -hmm. and, um, as part of the current uh, presentation there, you can see a, th a thorough line called Community Voice. It's a program that they have um, implemented um, uh, before in partial formats related to certain exhibits, but this time the entire collection of the museum has served as a springboard for um, uh, some members of, of the local community reflecting on the idea of the American dream to go alongside with the festival that we are part of. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to read a couple of, uh, to read a couple of statements for you that I um, you know, took photos of on my cell phone yesterday because I just was struck um, so much by um, how they resonated with um, what we are talking about at this panel in our program book and uh, 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 during our festival. So um, uh, some uh, members of the community, some of them are members, uh, uh, random members, some of them were asked specifically to uh, reflect on some artworks, share their ideas about certain um, uh, paintings on view um, in the collection. And uh, when I saw this uh, fabulous uh, painting by Anselm Kiefer related to the Holocaust with a huge railroad tracks on it, you might remember it uh, very vividly because it occupied almost an entire room there. It's called Lot's Wife. I also read uh, a statement by uh, Tomislav Mikhalevich, who is the CEO and president of the Cleveland Clinic. He said, um, the American dream is the foundation of this country. It is the shared hope that we can accomplish something great, regardless of our background, heritage, or race. 
The collective set of individual aspirations is what forms the American dream. There is hope and happiness, but not all of it is perfect. It can be also very rough. I am an immigrant from Croatia, so this means a great deal to me. This country has offered me unparalleled opportunities to grow and to make a difference. And I immediately thought about the connection with Bernard Herrmann's piece on yesterday's program, a suite from Vertigo. Bernard was not an immigrant himself, but he was very, very young, like several months old when his family came from mm -hmm. Eastern Europe. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and he uh, became one of the uh, most popular American composers through his participation um, in, um, uh, in the activities uh, um, at Hollywood. Mm -hmm. He wrote so many amazing soundtracks. And, uh, you know, uh, in a way, he, of course, was a very, very happy and high achieving person, but he was also sort of suffering from the idea that he was pigeonholed to Hollywood mm -hmm. rather than being accepted mm -hmm. as a composer of classical music. Mm -hmm. So that was a very clear connection to me between uh, a community voice in this local community and what we were performing yesterday. Another connection uh, that I would like to bring up um, is a statement by Phyllis Harris, who is the executive director of LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland, and she was responding to Paul Gauguin's uh, In the Waves painting uh, that feature a female figure, mm -hmm. and she wrote, for me, this painting is about strength and overcoming barriers. Uh, there is this female figure, a little curvy like me, about to emerge uh, from some adversity. If you are a woman, a person of color, or have disabilities, or just anything that is not mainstream, the American dream was not created with you in mind. Mm. And this is why we are talking about these mm. issues through musical programs at this festival. Mm. And I actually was delighted to experience um, statements like this, and I randomly chose, chose just a couple. <laughs> there are, there's about 50 of mm -hmm. them throughout the collection. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating experience to walk through it and read this and remember about our musical programs. Mm -hmm. Just yesterday we performed a music by a piece by Julia Perry, mm -hmm. um, a female African-American composer who was not accepted per mm -hmm. se. She was more successful than many, but she mm -hmm. wasn't accepted mm -hmm. um, as mm -hmm. a regular member of a uh, concert community around here. Mm -hmm. So um, um, I am curious if um, we could ask Alison <laughs> to actually respond to these mm -hmm. two pa uh, presentations. Um, along these lines or along any lines. Uh, I'm just really uh, curious to know if these conversations resonated with you as well, as much as they did with me. Oh, sure, absolutely, and I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, well, first, this, this idea of a fair trial, <clears throat> I find very significant. Um, but, but truly, this, this is a concept that reaches far beyond classical music um, mm -hmm. in this culture in particular. And if you're, if you're speaking specifically about the American dream and those of, those of us who maybe um, haven't really had access to it, um, this, this idea of a fair trial is cross, so crosses over mm -hmm. um, into so many mm -hmm. different areas. Mm -hmm. And I mean, honest and truly, it, it really goes back to the very beginning mm -hmm. of um, you know, 12 million Africans being stolen mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. brought over here and um, believed to be less than human mm -hmm. um, and treated as property only uh, for hundreds of years. Um, this makes it possible to not even consider something like a fair trial. It's not even a thought. You know, when you were talking about in 1842 and they were debating about like American versus German, it's like, <laughs> You know, of course they're not thinking about someone like me, for example. I mean, you know, um, during that time, what, where, what are black people in America doing, right? Um, so, again, I mean, this is this is very clear, and it, and it goes it goes beyond music. It goes it goes to um, it's ap applicable to anything. Um, this this country, unfortunately, 
has a history of an ideology that um, black people in particular are presumed guilty um, and less than. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is deeply, deeply embedded mm -hmm. in our society and um, has, has always been there and you really cannot uh, disassociate that from, from anything, let alone mm -hmm. classical music mm -hmm. and classical music inclusion mm -hmm. and programming and all of that. So, um, I, you know, I, I'm thinking a lot about this idea of presumed guilt or presumed inadequacy um, right off the bat. And that, unfortunately, is still very much alive today. I mean, it's 2023, and I, you know, I've still seen comments about my position with the Cleveland Orchestra um, where it's like, well, of course, you know, she's, you know, a DEI pick, you know, this, that, and the other, um, and nobody bothers to listen to my music because there's already the assumption that it can't possibly be good enough. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, an on, it's an ongoing thing, and we're very far from <laughs> a solution, but in my eyes, I think, um, and this is something I'm, I'm personally very, um, very passionate about just generally in, in, in all things in, in life. I think my idea of uh, achieving the American dream is it, it achieving this uh, way of life where we're not looking at people like that, where we're not presuming that they're guilty, where you know my kids, their kids can just have those opportunities and oftentimes you don't get those opportunities because it's already assumed that you're, you're incapable of doing it or not deserving of it. Um, so that to me is something that, because it is still an issue, is um, in the way for, of many people um, achieving this idea of American dream, which I think traditionally, I don't want to speak for everybody, but oftentimes is uh, symbolic of opportunity, right, and, and growth and thriving. Like you, I, love, I, love, I love thinking of it that way, um, as you put it. Um, so. That was, that was a, a really big, <laughs> I really latched onto that, that, that idea that you presented of this fair trial thing. Um, and it's interesting because I feel, you know, I was thinking about Nina Simone and what you said and, and this idea of also um, historically black musicians going elsewhere for opportunity because of this uh, door that, that historically has been shut. And we have these brilliant artists like, like Nina Simone, like you mentioned, or like someone like Quincy Jones, who I don't think was necessarily pursuing classical music, but he studied with like Nadia Boulanger in Europe and is a whole musician. And I believe that if it was something he wanted to do, he could do excellently because he's done everything else excellently. Um, and this is, this is a thing that I, f I feel like we constantly are finding ourselves doing. Um, pursuing this excellence and this versatility in order to just have the opportunity to, to do a thing. You know, I think it's, I've grown up with this feeling that I have to be excellent all the time, you know, and it's, and I think it's rooted in this. Um, I think it's something that I've absorbed subconsciously, um, but maybe also very directly, I've, I've experienced that too, but it seems to be something that's very common with people like myself and people like me um, because of this notion that people will automatically assume that because you're a woman or because you're black or because X, Y, Z, um, you can't possibly be able to do this thing. So I, I have to demonstrate like, yeah, I can, and I've done all these other things too at like this <laughs> extremely high level. Um, but that's very common with, with black people, um, I feel. Really yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Leonton Price, who's like, you have to be three times as good. Right? Yes. Leonton Price was saying, you have to be three times as good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And this, yeah. this crosses over into other professions, yeah. too. You yeah. know, I've met lawyers, doctors, mm -hmm. academics, mm -hmm. you know, um, who feel the same way. Mm -hmm. um, because of, it, because of that, that ideology that is ingrained in our society that we are presumably guilty and incapable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, that, and it's so, I mean, it's ridiculous, of course, but, you know, of course that idea exists because how else could our, our tragic history have happened the way that it did? You know, slavery, lynching, reconstruction, um, Jim Crow, segregation, all these things up until mass incarceration today. It's all very alive and well. It's just kind of reformed over the years. Um, so I think about you know these musicians who have who have gone on to other other things, and I and I do wonder had Nina Simone 
been able to go to Curtis, would she have been a classical concert pianist only? But also, I'm thankful that it worked out because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for her in other yeah. ways, because, yeah. I mean, she's a brilliant artist who is, um, who became a revolutionary and, um, and her music is, you, you know, you can hear in her playing that she has that language, that she has that background. Um, and she brilliantly incorporated it into this new voice. So I'm, you know, I'm thankful, I'm grateful for her work and for the way um, that she turned this negative experience into like her own voice. Um, but it is unfortunate how that happened, but this is also a thing that we do. We learn how to kind of like adapt and find our own way. Um, when I started composing, I did not start necessarily with the ambition that I would write for <laughs> symphony orchestras. That wasn't necessarily the goal. I started writing because I knew that I didn't, I was, I, I had been, um, very, very like intensely groomed to be a classical flutist. And I kind of fell into that because I started playing the flute at 10 and I just loved playing and I loved music. And it seemed like the best way to get the best training. Um, it was never because I exclusively wanted to play classical music, mm -hmm. though I deeply love it. And um, I am so grateful for um, the deep education that I have had in the world of classical music. Um, but there's other music I love too, and there's other artists that I love too, and it's, and it's always been that way. Um, so when I was in my early 20s, and very much on this trajectory of being a, you know, a classically flutist, more specifically like an orchestral classically flutist, because that was the pedagogy really at the time. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of changed, but it's, you know, it's still pretty much the dominant pedagogy mm -hmm. for someone who is majoring in performance in a conservatory. Um, I knew that that's, that wasn't the be all end all for me. And I think I also felt now in retrospect that I wasn't 100% sure that was the place for me. You know, I could do the job if I wanted to. Am I gonna be happy? Um, am I gonna be supported? Am I gonna be tokenized? Am I gonna be exhausted day in and day out by people who are shocked to see me? You know, that kind of thing. So. I do think that that was a part of how I was feeling. Um, and for a few years, I, you know, I started just kind of trying different things, different musical things to see what else I can do. And that's how I eventually ended up composing. Um, and I thought I was just gonna compose for myself and for my, my ensemble. And I was happy with that. And I, I always knew that my classical playing and training would come out. I mean, I can't divorce myself from it even if I tried. Um, it's in there, and, and that's great. Um, but I didn't necessarily even envision that I would have the type of composition career that I have today. And I think also because I just didn't see it. I just didn't see it. What did I see? I studied Brahms. I studied Beethoven. You know, I studied all of these European white males, many of whom were dead, <laughs> which is very not me. So, you know, it's just the association really um, I didn't have. And I, you know, I, again, I don't think at the time I realized that there was that lack of connection there because I, I mean, again, I was in my like early 20s. This is a long time ago, but now for sure, for sure. I mean, I imagine like I probably if, if there was someone like me who I was exposed to when I was coming up, I think I would have had a completely different um, vision as to how things would play out. So um, so anyway, so that that's really how I started composing. And I am still more well known in the, the new music kind of subcategory of classical music, which um, is historically a little more inviting because it's all new. It's very, you know, there's more room for experimentation. Um, I have never been the flutist that plays the Mozart concerto, you know, all over the place or, you know, anything like that. And, um, you know, kind of growing and, and networking in that world is how commissions started blossoming and it was all very organic um, and now we're here today but another thing that really struck a chord with me when you said when you mentioned that a lot of um, black Americans were finding opportunities through Europeans yeah. that's literally what happened to yeah. me mm. here you know because our music director Franz is Austrian um, so I'm really thinking about that right now actually and I'm thinking about a lot of my other like colleagues um, who I know well like Jesse Montgomery or mm -hmm. Um, like Carlos Simons, there, there are other contemporary black composers um, who are around my age. And I, you know, when I think about it, 
they also kind of start it in a, in a DIY way. You know, we don't have the, the experience of Nico Muley or, you know, Andrew Norman. Yeah, that's not, that's not, the, that's not our story no, at all. That's right. All of us have this kind of like, you know, like windy road and all these other things that we did too that kind of led up to these opportunities. So it's very, it's very interesting. And I think, yeah, I think um, considering that and so many other things that you said, I really feel like I'm kind of a living testament of all their research, <laughs> which feels a little weird, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's all very, yeah. very true. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Allison. It's uh, actually fabulous to realize that the Cleveland Orchestra has recognized your talent. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's uh, incredible that you, will be, you have already written for this orchestra and will be doing much more with them in the coming years. Mm -hmm. And I want to congratulate the orchestra and you, of course. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a stunning achievement mm -hmm. uh, in the right direction, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, we have a few minutes left, and I would like to ask um, our audience members if you might have questions for panelists. Mm -hmm. There's uh, a mic in the middle of the room. Um, somebody has a question. Oh, maybe someone can bring him the microphone. You want to go to the mic? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was thinking in terms of uh, Don Shirley, I don't know if you're familiar with them. Is it oh, Jamaican? Don Shirley, a Jamaican uh, pianist who's uh, classically trained, uh, child friends, gee, uh, classically trained in Moscow, mm. uh, lived in Florida, uh, did a lot of TV presentations with the Don mm. Shirley Trio. Mm. Uh, he played uh, Waterboy uh, in a Marsh Marketplace. It's a, okay, and uh, I had an idea for uh, a larger orchestra playing Brazilian music, for example. Uh, and I found in Cleveland, uh, the person that I had talked to said, well, you should just keep it to a small group, okay, like Vila Lomos, Hector Vila Lomos. And uh, the Brazilian era series, okay. mm -hmm. and uh, would do the more traditional Bach, and then he would do uh, Afro-Brazilian music. Okay. And I brought that up. And, well, we have a Hispanic population here, so they wouldn't like that. Okay. So you know, this is Iberian uh, influence. Uh, highly regarded among his peers in Latin America or South America. And uh, it's, it's just a total ignorance. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember watching a, a television program about uh, a Congo, the Democratic Republic, or uh, you know, the French or the Belgian. I forget which it was. But, group of musicians that decided to buy their own classical instruments and play classical music and the response from a lot of Americans was, well, they should stick to their own music, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. their own native mm -hmm. music and their own native instruments. You know, this is not right. Um, it's like someone's imposing it on them and they said, no, no one's imposing it on us. Mm -hmm. This is a universal deal to us, this music. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we do appreciate you know, some of our native music, but, you know, we also appreciate the universal. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, a number of these people are uh, you know, Protestant or, or uh, you know, Catholic or Christian or uh, areas of Africa that are Jewish or whatever, have, you know, or Orthodox like in Ethiopia. And it goes back to uh, Greek influence in Northern Africa go back to the Greek, we think of the Greek as being European, they're actually Asian if you go by the DNA. Mm -hmm. And they were influenced, some of their instruments were originally influenced by, uh, you know, the Sumerians, for example, or, you know, in the area of Iraq. Uh, the, you know, uh, for example, the harp, you know, the, that uh, 
Seiko was entertained by. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, book by Jamie James, mm -hmm. uh, Music with the Spears. Well, you don't mind, you only have about 15 minutes left. So. Yeah, I apologize. I shouldn't have said anything at all. No, no, no. Please ask the question. We will be right. happy to. But, um, you know, this relating it to this music, you know, of the West. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is uh, the idea is, you know, the European is like, you know, Northern European or, or uh, the idea of Rome, uh, but uh, it really goes back to Greece, and that was uh, Jamie James. He was a uh, critic for the London Times and also the New York Times, a music critic. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'd bring that up. Thanks for the recommendation. Yeah. 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 I think the internationalism, to use a word that you mentioned earlier, the internationalism of classical music is, um, on a scholarly level, is still being teased out, like where things come from and how people move. And I know that even Elena's work is about migration of musicians uh, to different places and you know how, how the movement of people affects musical creation is just really a profound subject and something that, that as you said, goes back thousands of years to kind of trace um, origins and things. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the kind of connection to <clears throat> how these cross-cultural influences have shaped uh, e even where we are now in terms of um, European culture interfacing with, with different cultures here. And, and how that can be manifest in an orchestra's programming. So thank, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, a wonderful presentation to both of you. Doug, um, you and I need to talk about what was going on with the New York Phil in the middle of the 18th, uh, 19th century. Mm. It was exactly going on in France. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. So and that's my research. Yeah, no, I've, re I've, re I've read your stuff, yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> Hmm. And you mentioned the very complicated racial environment in Europe, of course. Yeah. And of course, the others in Europe mm -hmm. were Jews, mm -hmm. Roma, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Those were the people that were considered a threat, mm -hmm. if you want to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it seems to me, and I don't know if this is right or not, is it plausible that African Americans were coming over there and just seen as exotic? And also, was there an element of <laughs> We're kind of we're superior to those ignorant Americans mm. who are so prejudiced and everything. Yeah. We Europeans are much more sophisticated. Yes. And much more embracing. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so complicated and it's so contra it's so contradictory. I mean, I, which I kind of alluded to, you know, saying it's not true. Like I understand this is a thing that's so hard as I want to hold on to African American dreams for freedom, right? And and that they go to Europe, and I, the thing that's complicated is, is that I want to recognize that they are having liberating experiences. That to many of them, it's the irony, Europe is the land of opportunity, right? That Europe is the place where they find uh, liberation. Europe is the place where they feel like they can finally be themselves. So W.E.B. Du Bois, the African-American intellectual, founder of the NAACP, um, he studies at the University of Berlin in the 1880s. You know, and it, that's 100% his experience, is that he, he loves Germany, you know, and German culture. Wagner, he becomes a huge Wagnerian, you know. Um, and to him, it's, it's, it's so liberating that he, um, it's like his whole body was so used to flinching from the violence of Jim Crow and like that he didn't know how to interact with white people, but like, like, you know, white people in this different way, you know, like a white woman would just come up to him and talk to him and he's like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to be doing that. You know, like we could both get in trouble for this, right? Um, so, so it's interesting. I want to recognize that that is true, that, that for opera singers like Sissy Aretta Jones, she's like, I can stay in any hotel, you know, I can drink from any water fountain and have these liberating experiences, whereas you're right at the same time, these are also places and spaces that are putting, 
you know, Africans on display in zoos, right? Um, and that are, are, are participating in their own kind of racial politics. It's what makes it so confusing and fascinating and complicated. Um, you know, that you also do have, as you're pointing out, many white Europeans who are going to be champions and activists for African-American civil rights um, across the 20th century. Um, while, while at the same time ignoring other problems at home. And that, I mean, this is, okay, this is me ranting a little bit, but, the, but it's so interesting realizing, I think there, this disconnect for African Americans as well. Um, I mean, here's the most shocking example I, I can think about that I think about sometimes, which is that W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, loves Germany. He's there in the 1880s, 1890s. He comes back several times in the 1910s and 20s. Um, he's also in, he goes to Bayreuth, you know, the you know, Center for, for Wagner stuff. He goes to Bayreuth in 1936 under the Nazis. You know, and he's like, I'm having a great time. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Like, what the, do you know where you are, right? I mean, so it's so interesting. I don't know if I always want to call it like a blind refusal to see. Th I think it's also, you know, I, I just want to hold both things to be possible at the same time that African Americans are going to different, you know, places in Europe trying to find allies, trying to find, and, and really having such wildly different experiences than in the United States, while at the same time, white Europeans are absolutely participating in their own racial politics of denigration, calling them primitive, you know, calling black people primitive and all of this at the same time. Both things can be true at the same time, I think. Yeah, well, and I would just add, I mean, you made this point already, but the, the difference between the experience of African Americans, yeah. emphasis on American and in American Europe, identity. Yeah. Yeah, nationality, yeah, versus um, African colonial subjects who are in the 20th century who are still uh, subject largely to European colonial rule before independence um, and are forced into conscripted uh, army work, that sort of thing, are you know deeply denigrated, and all, all the way down to the the zoo displays sort of yeah. thing. Um, so the experience of, of blackness, yeah. as you've shown, very different depending on yeah. well, origin, okay. national origin. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, not to get it, not to get into it too, but, but like I have this conversation with African American classical musicians today. You know, where you, if you if you're in a private room with some folks who have studied in Europe or concertized or performed in Europe and in the United States, like you you can ask the question like which is better? Where do you think is better, Europe or the United States? And you get wildly different answers to that question. Mm. You know, um, it's complicated for me. I grew up in Europe, right? I grew up in Vienna, Austria, and experienced racism. So I'm like, I don't I don't think it's better in Vienna. I think Vienna is worse in some ways than so many other places. You know, so so but nonetheless, and somebody else I know who is an African American opera singer loves Vienna, right? And it's like for her, this was a liberating place to experience in her twenties for the first time. Like it's what makes this also so complicated. Yeah, I, I would just quickly add and, and confirm um, in my experience this idea of like exoticism <laughs> is very much alive and well. Um, I can recount performing in France in Nice when years ago when I was still in college and I felt very much like an anomaly, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and though no one was um, blatantly rude, I felt very welcomed and, and all of that, there was this kind of cringy feeling somewhat of like fetishism mm -hmm. happening mm -hmm. at the same time, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. I think about, you know, thinking about someone like um, uh, Josephine Baker, okay, mm -hmm. for example. That, that's, that's what I was reminded of. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, there, it's, there's like an element of fascination too. Mm -hmm. I, I remember another time I was in France in 2009 and Michael Jackson had just passed away mm -hmm. and Barack mm -hmm. Obama had just become president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I swear, everywhere I went, everyone wanted to talk to me about yeah. that, those two things, yeah. right? Because I, you know, I stood out like a thumb as obviously I'm American, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know the the fascination of my Black American experience, mm -hmm. you know, especially considering these two major things that had just happened, and and the way that um, it's almost like people wanted to like gather around and like <laughs> like listen. <laughs> so that was a little strange and, and off putting. But little things like that mm -hmm. still very much happen today, mm -hmm. and in Asia too. Oh, this, yeah. is, this has happened to me in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, 
I have a lot of friends who are jazz musicians who play a lot in Japan, and they experience, you know, you know, jazz is really big in Japan. Um, but they experience very similar things. It's like this this mix of admiration, mm -hmm. and also like, are you real? Mm -hmm. And also, just I don't know. It, it's it's a little. It can be surreal at times, but it's not as threatening feeling as some experiences that I've had in the United States. Mm. I think that that's seems how to be a lot the big of, difference. That's how a lot of African American classical musicians across the 19th and 20th century talked about it. Yeah. Like um, the Fisk, like Ella Shepard, who was one of the original members of the Fisk Jubilee Singers, toured in Germany in 1877, and she records in her diary entry that she's getting stared at all the time. But she feels like the stares are more curious than hostile, yeah. yes. right? For for her, so she's willing to accept it. You know, I'm not willing to accept it for all hosts of reasons, but nonetheless, right. like she, you know, she. It's like if you have to choose, <laughs> yeah. you know, your yeah. odds yeah. are yeah. you'll probably live longer in one yeah. situation right. than right. another, mm. depending on right. what time it is. But yeah, 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 it's very real. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Thank you guys uh, for the, your presentation. So enlightening. Okay. Um, I'd like for you to speak to the idea of tradition and classical music, especially with orchestras, mm. and how um, that you know goes along with uh, composers forming new traditions. How these traditions have come to be. Um, it seems to me, um, as a classical musician, that what what orchestras in this country value it. It very much is based, and it is, you know, Europe, and um, I think also tied in with that is is whiteness, mm -hmm. and and what, you know, you know, so many of my colleagues is like, oh, I'm Polish, I'm Russian, I'm German, I, mm -hmm. and so when we tour over there, it's like there's this real connection, mm -hmm. and um, so yeah, if you can speak mm -hmm. to tradition and mm -hmm. classical music, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the incredible observations, and, and I would just, I mean, this is a little bit of a cop-out, simple answer, because I think it's more complicated than this, but the, the reliance on European repertoire throughout the 19th century that I referred to, it, it, it disabled a rupture from tradition that I don't think composers were, were necessarily seeking in terms of severing from tradition, but reshaping tradition in a kind of different national context. And so the, the persistent whiteness, say, of orchestral culture is, I think, part of an opportunity lost that uh, th there were opportunities for developing, particularly in the 1880s and 90s, mm -hmm. with this, this explosion of participation among uh, African-American classical musicians at that early stage that was then just locked off mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. conservatory training, mm -hmm. that the professional opportunities simply weren't available. Mm -hmm. And so the, the ties to tradition are, on the one hand, definitely ideological. Um, but I think looking at it through a historical lens, they're just very practical, too, in the sense of opportunities denied. Mm -hmm. um, and so how to rethink that is, bears the weight of nearly 200 years of tradition, but traditions built on the denial and the kind of boxing out of various things that might rupture or reshape those traditions. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, as Allison has suggested, organizations are still dealing with that. And of course, there's a lot of impatience about, you know, why is this, given that there were many opportunities mm -hmm. over the years to reshape institutional relationships to tradition. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll say one thing, which was, you know, I think building on that, um, Alex Ross had that piece in The New Yorker, oh, what, a couple of years ago about musicologists and confronting oh, yeah. white supremacy. Mm -hmm. But one of the great lines at the end was like, you know, when we think about the history of American classical music or American art music, you know, and in, in, in the late 19th, early 20th century, you know, with all of these different composers being shut out of it, the real losers of this were American classical music, right? Like the real losers of all of this um, were these institutions. And, and that's the, the damage that's in some ways been 
been done. Um, you know, I mean, one tiny thing, I'll just say this as a European historian, you know, and as somebody who grew up in Europe and has family in Europe, um, you know, the, a lot of the work that I do on the European side of things, if this is helpful, is also just confronting the mythology of whiteness in Europe. Like, why do we keep imagining Europe as a white continent? You know, um, there are so many people who identify as black and French or, you know, black British, but all of these other different things, you know? So I think just by just poking at that myth of, of like European whiteness at all and saying, well, what if we did actually orient ourselves around George Bridge Tower, right? Or what if we did orient ourselves around, you know, different figures? I think it opens up whole other world, uh, other ways to explore Europe in the first place, if that helps. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the Bridge Tower in particular had this long career in like London oh, too, yeah, af England. after the Cambridge Beethoven situation. Well. Yeah. 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 And, right. and was, you know, relatively successful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I really find interesting about the, the argument that a lot of people make about the upholding of tradition and how, you know, you, you hear from the other side that, you know, bringing in all these new voices is going to, like, water down the quality or mm, compromise yeah. the, oh. the, the practice mm. and the other. Um, but nobody, I'm not hearing enough conversation about the, the the ideology that is rooted behind the tradition, mm. which mm. you cannot divorce it from mm. um, concepts of elitism and supremacy. Mm -hmm. You just can't. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be like a the, the real conversation that people want to dodge. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually a conversation mm -hmm. that we really mm -hmm. absolutely need to have, or else you know we're going to have this same mm. panel 50 years from now. <laughs> right. Um, yes. Yeah. You know, it might be slightly different, but not really. So I think, and again, like I was saying before, I mean, this this is a, this is applicable to so many things you know, even outside our, our little world of, of classical music. Um, but that, to me, is the thing that we're really, you know, grappling with and, 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 and asking about. And um, I don't know that, <laughs> I, I don't know that we're totally there as far as everybody being ready to kind of, to admit where this belief comes from. You know, you mentioned someone um, saying how American, what was the word he used? He, did, he described American music as, um, what was it like peasant peasant music? Was that what you said? Oh, or, yeah, yeah, something like that. I don't some, know yeah, something phrase, along those. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. But this, but that, you know, you can trace that idea back to, well, what really is American music? Like, who are Americans? I, m I am the result of hundreds of years of generations and generations of Americans. I, I fully, like, my DNA embodies American history, 100. percent And to me, you, you know, American music is is our story, is our story of slavery, of black people, of indigenous people, and of everything coming together. Um, and you hear that, you know? So when, when, you, when you hear the criticism already of like American music being less than, you can't disassociate it from the people who make American music, right. right? Which is a very diverse group of people um, and, and has a very complicated history, right? So I think really it all goes back to that, this crazy notion <laughs> that exists that of this better than mm -hmm. and greater than. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know we're, we're running out of time. I just wanted to add one thing to this, which is that in one of Florence Price's <clears throat> letters to Serge Kuzovitsky that I mentioned earlier in 1943, which is after the United States had entered World War II, Kuzovitsky had gone on this national uh, kind of tirade saying, oh, we need to support American composers. Um, America is the great melting pot and all of this stuff. And Price writes to Kuzovitsky almost what you just said, where she mm -hmm. says, um, you know, if what you want to support is the melting pot, here I am. Mm -hmm. right. Here's mm -hmm. my music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Like, why That's do it. you need to yeah. make this call? And mm -hmm. so she, she is kind of calling the bluff of mm -hmm. this kind of European and white supremacist view of um, this, this kind of European-oriented view of what America is. She's like, here I am. This yeah. is America. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I think, what, anyway, what you said deeply resonates and I think mm. is um, part of what's informing this relationship with tradition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On that note, I'd like to invite all of you to another session, which will begin in about an hour in this same room, uh, which um, relates to DNA. Oh. Uh, it's titled Cleveland's Cultural DNA and the American Dream. 
we will be talking about social issues, political <coughs> issues related to this locality, to the city of Cleveland, um, and uh, many uh, important representatives from the partner organizations that have participated in our festival will be here. Um, and uh, I hope you can stay around and it will be similarly invigorating discussions, I'm sure. Thank you very much to Great. the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, and yeah. thank you both for your presentations. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, you're, you're. I'm gonna have to buy some yearbooks and go deep, oh. <laughs> well, deep down the well. Your first commentary mm. about the fair trial and the presumption of guilt 